this workshop, it's going to be about an hour long. It's a workshop looking at awareness and also tying in breathing. I do have a presentation, which I'll go in and out of. And it's looking at awareness from a number of different perspectives, but what is awareness and how can you improve your own awareness? And I suppose really what's the objective of all this? The objective is to make life a bit softer and the objective is to increase happiness, but also to increase not just your quality of life, but productivity, your ability to experience life. And you can imagine that you're going to a Michelin star, star restaurant and somebody puts a, a beautiful meal in front of you. But if you're fully immersed in thought, you're not going to see the meal that's in front of you because you're stuck in your head. And when you take a, a bite or a mouthful of that meal, you're not going to taste that meal because you're stuck in your head. And nor are you going to smell the meal. So you might as well be eating a bowl of cornflakes. How do we experience life that if you do have, you know, something as beautiful as a fabulous dinner put in front of you that you can actually enjoy it? And that's just one example. We're also talking about in everyday situations. I was stuck in my own head for 20 plus years. Many of you have been stuck in your own heads. Many of you are maybe still in your own heads. I'm not saying that I'm enlightened, enlightened or anything like that. As Ram Das says, he says, if you think you're enlightened, go live with your family for a week and that soon put it to the test. But it makes life is a bit softer. And it really, really is. And in terms of also intuition, creativity, and just enjoying it, enjoying life, because we, we don't fully, you know, it's just one of those things that has been totally overlooked. And I think the education system, not the teachers, but the education system has really let us down with this one. And I would also go as far as saying that institutionalized religion, but I'm not going to put the blame on anybody, but those domains that had the capacity to really do a good job here didn't do a good job. And we left formal education after 16 years and we didn't have the ability to fully bring our attention into the present moment and enter flow states and deal with stress and experience life. We weren't equipped with those tools. And it's very, very important because when we are able to experience life, our focus is much better, our concentration is better, our attention is better, but our stress levels are less, our anxiety is less. So I was fortunate enough, I came across this back, as I often mentioned, in 1997-98. And then I remember going to a hotel room in Dublin, and I think it was the Gresham Hotel in Stevens Green. And there were two presenters there giving a course, and they were immersed in presence. And I just sat listening to them. And whatever happened there, I walked out of that room and I walked down Grafton Street for the first time and I fully experienced the street. It was almost as if I was on acid and I have taken acid before, so it wasn't quite the same, but it was kind of an experience that I'd never experienced before. It was a stillness of the mind that I was fully immersed in the present moment. I walked down the street, I could see the sights, I could hear the sounds, I could smell the smells. I wasn't stuck in my head. Now, the next morning I woke up, I was stuck in my head again. So I had a fleeting glance or a glimpse of what was possible. And it really raised my curiosity. And that's what brought me down the path. I then went and I spent two weeks in Egypt under a master, um, which was very important because he was immersed in presence. And when you're in the company of somebody, who is immersed in presence, they have to bring you into presence. We transmit something through our own states and goes beyond the words. It's almost that there's something transmitted as human beings and it's between the words. And you will know this yourself. If you're listening to or reading a book and if the, the writer or if the speaker, if the speaker is in a state of mind that they are present, they will have to bring you into presence. And I don't want to go down the whole new agey field or left of woo woo and all of that stuff, because I don't think any of us can explain what's happening. 
but we can experience it. And I would say that when you first go down this path, it can be a little bit frustrating because we as human beings, we often set a goal and we say to ourselves, well, I want to practice being aware because I'm here, but I want to get there. And already you're jumping to the future. And we also don't give our attention to ourselves because everything is consuming our attention and seldom do we bring our attention inwards. But if I was to say what is the most important aspect of this work, it's not about improving sports performance. It's about bringing people into present moment awareness. And even though we do look at improving sports performance and helping people with sleep disorder, breathing and asthma, um, I think the biggest gift is, is changing states. So I'm gonna start off with um, this presentation. I've kind of kept it simple. It's by the way, it's completely taken out of the book Atomic Focus, so there's nothing new in it. Um, and I started off this last week. Focus is about narrowing your attention to one thing. And I think it's really, really important to know or at least to have some idea of where we're going in life. And also when you wake up in the morning that you have an idea of what you want to focus on that day, because if we're scattered all over the place, we tend to get nowhere. Now, the only reason I talk about this from a work point of view is that there's something very self-rewarding when you achieve a mastery at something that you love to do. And if you can make a difference, there's something very, very rewarding in it. So focus is important. And you could say focus in a broader sense that you're, you choose a vocation or you, know, you become a school teacher or whatever you become, that you're not scattering your attention across 20 different things. And when you wake up in the morning is also to have focus on whatever you want to put your attention on that day. Concentration is your ability to hold your attention on one thing. And concentration, of course, is going to be influenced by your capacity to direct your attention. But if the mind is racing, your concentration is going to be impaired. And if you're consumed by thought, and if there's many distracting thoughts coming into the mind, your concentration is going to be sabotaged. And very often we sabotage our own success. We sabotage our own success because we don't have the ability to direct our attention. And we let our mind go off on, on a train of thought. And we've been doing this for thousands of years. None of this is new. Attention span is the length of time that we can hold our attention on one thing. And when we multiply focus by concentration and attention span, that will deem you success. Now, success is different meaning for everybody. So whatever your focus is, if you're building a house, you're going to focus on that one thing. But there's many aspects to building a house, and you need to be able to concentrate on that. You know, there's no point in you putting down skirting boards and you're racing to the future that you don't have attention on what you're doing at that moment because the quality of work is going to suffer. And your attention span, of course, is going to influence the quality of work. But the person who has good concentration and attention span, they have the capacity to direct their attention. And this is not just about success. The very same tools that you will use to improve your success, those same tools also are instrumental in helping to, to manage stress and helping to achieve a, a softer life and a more experienced life. And how many of us actually go through life if our attention is fully immersed in thought? We spend six, seven, eight decades on this planet and we haven't experienced life at all because how can we experience life if we're stuck in our head? And we have been trained to think, and that's the unfortunate thing. We've actually been trained to analyze, to decipher, to reason, to break information into tiny pieces. We have been trained how to think. We have not been trained how to stop thinking. I spoke about this last week. Deep sleep is absolutely instrumental. I don't think we will have any awareness if we're going around and we don't have energy and we're feeling groggy and we're feeling irritable you know, it really will impact our ability to be breath and body and mind aware. Functional breathing patterns, and that's an array of breathing exercises. 
to help change the physiology because very often when we have agitation of the mind, our sleep is impacted, but also our physiology is that we're in that increased sympathetic drive or increased stress response. And if our physiology is in an increased stress response, it's more difficult and challenging to be aware. Now, for me, the easiest place to start with awareness was fo focusing on the breath. It was by far the easiest place to start and also focusing on breathing exercises whereby I create, created air hunger. Those breathe light exercises are reduced volume breathing exercises that you're gently softening the speed of your breathing to create a feeling of air hunger that your mind is more likely to be anchored onto the breath. And the breathe light exercises also, they're helping to improve blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. They're helping to stimulate the vagus nerve. So what invincible breathing is kind of the phrase that we use to describe looking at breathing from a number of different dimensions. And many of you, of course, you're aware of this. Breath aware, body aware, and mind aware is so much easier when you have deep sleep and functional breathing patterns. Now, how many people with mental health issues, they have neither deep sleep nor functional breathing. And 75% of the population with panic disorder and anxiety have dysfunctional breathing patterns. And then they are introduced to mindfulness. How can you be mindful when your physiology is in a state of fight or flight? It's very important to address the physiology. And self-actualization is simply reaching your full potential, whatever your potential is in life. And it could be raising a most beautiful family. And that's your, that's your full, that's your potential. Tremendous. Because whatever it is, you know, there's nothing about this in terms of making money or anything like that. I think it is the pleasure when we look back that we say that we gave life our best shot and we experienced it as opposed to going through life being asleep. We spoke about this last week as well. Um, the breathe, the connection between the breath, the mind, and sleep. Now, in very simple terms, breath awareness and originally coming from Buddhism, Anapanasati is simply focusing on the breath. And just even focusing on a very small part of the body is easier to start with. There's four places at which you can feel the airflow coming into the body. You can feel the airflow coming into the nose just inside the nostrils is very tender towards airflow. But you might also feel the airflow at the back of the throat. You might feel your chest rising and falling, or you might have movement of the abdomen. So there is actually four places that you can bring your attention onto, the, onto your breath. Probably the easiest place to start is just inside the nostrils. Now, at the start, you might notice that you're thinking about your breathing, but you're not necessarily following it. But that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Eventually, you will emerge with your breath. So just be patient and go easy with yourself on it. And you'll never waste any time with this one. So don't feel guilty about doing nothing. It's very nice to bring your attention out of your mind and onto your breathing and just inside the nostrils. And if you're thinking about your breathing at the start, don't worry about that. Just gently bring your attention back inside the nose. And you're feeling the slightly colder air coming into the nose. And you're feeling the slightly warmer air as it's leaving the nose. And if your mind wanders off, which is going to do, gently bring your attention back onto your breathing. And you might also find that when you're doing this is, is where are you placing your attention inside in your head? So, for example, it's likely that our critical and thinking mind is when we have our attention very much to the front of the head. But if you were able to bring your attention, and this will be more body awareness, but I'll just touch on it now, towards the center of the head or even towards the back of the head, that you're taking your attention literally out of the frontal part and into the center and back, that you're also able to help to bring a stillness and a quietness to the mind and a capacity to hold your attention. But focusing on your breath is a great place to start because if you can focus your attention on your breathing, you can also focus your attention on any task that you want to do. Start off with something small. You're feeling the airflow coming into your nose. You're feeling the airflow leaving the nose. Your mind wanders off. You're bringing your attention back onto your breathing. You could be stuck in traffic. You know, you could be waiting for somebody. Focusing your attention on the breath. For me, it's the easiest place to start. 
you know, and the mind will wander. And that's inevitable. Bring it back. And it does get easier and it gets better with practice. And your capacity to direct your attention will absolutely and certainly improve. And if you were to go a little bit scientific into it, that the brain itself does change. So the brain changes when we direct our attention and the amygdala, which would be responsible for the fight or flight response shrinks. And with changes and structural changes in the brain, it, we have to develop our resilience. And if anybody is here because of, say, for, for instance, the corporate world, I did a degree in business. And I absolutely will tell you this. I come out of university and I went into the corporate world and I hated every minute of it. Let's be honest with you. The stress levels were immense, but it wasn't just the corporation. It wasn't the corporation. I didn't have the capacity to deal with the situation. This, we were not gave these tools. So we weren't gave the tools in university to be able to cope with the real life situation of what's demanded outside of it. And if you think it's bad back 30 years ago when I came out in 1997, well, it must be a totally different story now because when you've got 100 or 200 or 300 emails and everybody is looking for a bit of you and you have to reply to everybody and you have to do your tasks and you have to be doing this and you have to be doing that, it's really time that we start wondering where is it all going? And um, any opportunity that you have, give yourself a little bit of attention. And also the more aware or attention you can bring into the body, you'll be better placed to sense when you're getting a little bit stressed. And, you know, when we have that, when we, when we have an idea of where we are at, we can then do something about it, or at least we have a better choice. So breath awareness, very simple. You know, you're just focusing on the slightly colder air coming into the nose and the slightly warmer air leaving the nose. And you might be thinking about it at the start, just keep bringing your attention back. Or you might, as I said, feel it easier to feel the airflow at the back of the throat or your chest and tummy. And you may have to look at your breathing. So oftentimes when I'm working with people who are very much in thought, we, we use our hands as any of the instructors here, because I see quite a few of you here. And we're showing the student their breath, show them their breathing. So if you're doing this for your own, for your own use, look down at your breathing. So you're looking at it visually, listen to your breathing, feel your breathing and bring your senses onto your breath. And um, if you find it a little bit challenging, well, it's probably good because at least now you're starting to notice here is something that there's some room for improvement and use your breathing. It's not just that we are working to train the breath. The biggest thing that we were doing is we are helping to train the brain. And you don't have to be on a yoga mat. You know, I was kind of giving out about yoga earlier on because I said that they've done a terrible job of breathing over the last 40 years. And because they have the, the capacity to transform states from so many dimensions of breathing and also to bring the breath and the instruction in yoga off the mat. You know, it's not how we breathe on the mat. You could be the most perfect meditator, and I've seen them. They're most perfect, so straight, so serenity. And then they come off the practice and they're all over the place. Isn't it much better that we could bring this into our everyday life and we can connect with the breath that way? So at the start, you might feel that you have to do a formal practice because I think it is good to do a formal practice because it just generates your capacity to do it. And also don't wait until a difficult situation presents itself. You know, don't say, well, things are fine now. I'm not gonna bother doing any meditating. I'm not gonna focus on my breathing. Well, how long will things last for fine? Start now. And then when a difficult situation presents itself, you have the capacity then to, to tap into those tools that you're, you're after developing. Even as we're listening here, can you listen here with your sound, looking with your sight, feeling your body being carried by the chair or if you're standing and listen with every cell of your body. And you know, you can start now. Or do you find yourself that you're drifting off? Well, maybe that's my problem. But if you find yourself drifting off, just gently bring your attention back onto the, onto the talk. 
So your everyday life is very important. You know, you're going for a lovely walk in nature, bring your attention inwards, experience life and ask yourself, how often do we truly experience life? And this was something that I had a hard time grappling with. You know, when you talk to people about present moment awareness, they're starting to think about it, analyzing it, breaking it down. It's not about that. It's the experience. It's the experience about it being able to quieten everything and that you have your attention fully in, that your attention is moving simultaneously with time. It's not in the past, it's not in the future, but it's fully here now. I don't think we can describe it, you know? It's very difficult to describe, but a cat, any of you that has a cat or has a dog, your cat has absolutely no pr problem. And I spoke about this this morning. Your cat has no problem taking a rest, the cat is not thinking about the past. The cat is not thinking about the future. When is it going to catch the next mouse? The cat is fully immersed in the present moment. Our dogs, same. They're not thinking about the past or the future. Yes, they can be traumatized, but they're traumatized by human mind, not by their own mind. So, you know, we should be able to take some examples. So the cat doesn't feel guilty about lounging around. If any of you have a cat, you'll see that they love to lounge around. And the dog doesn't feel guilty either. But we feel guilty because we've been conditioned. Um, and one way in terms of those layers of conditioning that have been imposed upon us from a very, very young age, those layers of conditioning can help to dissolve the more we bring our attention fully into the present moment. And as I said at the start, you know, it's kind of nice because we experience life. So bring your attention to your breath many times throughout the day. Your mind wanders off. It's, it's normal. Bring your attention back. And you'll have good days and you'll have bad days. And don't set it as a goal. Don't set it as a goal that I'm going to start doing this now because I want to calm mind because already the mind has jumped into the future. This is all about the process. Have no expectations. Bring your attention onto your breathing. Hold your attention there. And even two seconds is better than none. And this is really about breathing for people, about bringing it for everybody and to train your brain, it's for you. And if you can train your brain to hold your attention on your breath, you can teach it to hold your attention on any task. Now, in the last part one of this, we had that attention span, you know, in terms of sit down with a piece of paper and hold your attention on your breathing for three minutes. And every time your mind wanders, tick it on the piece of paper and add the number of ticks. And then practice bringing your attention out of your mind and onto your breathing different times throughout the day. And even if you wake up at four o'clock in the morning and your mind is racing, and it's not easy, bring your attention onto the breath, the mind wanders off, bring your attention onto the breath. And the other thing about this is that when you're thinking about bringing your attention onto your breathing, always think of the exhalation. So we don't want to use it as a means of helping to generate awareness, but we also want to incorporate changing our physiology. So in terms of the, the breath and the stress response, and you'll see a lot more detail if you weren't at the, the first one, take a very soft breath in through your nose. It shouldn't be heard. It should be silent. It should be light. And the key is to have a relaxed exhalation because it's the relaxed and the prolonged exhalation that your body is telling the brain that everything is okay. So it's not just focusing your attention on the breath, but it's actually about changing breathing patterns. Breathe light, breathe slow, breathe low. And these are three different dimensions and you will see them in part one. Breathing light is about improving your breathing from a biochemical point of view. Breathing slow is very important for helping to bring a balance in the autonomic nervous system. And breathing low is about improving the amplitude of the diaphragm. So use it, you know, even though it's, it's like mindfulness traditionally will say, don't change your breathing. I think it's very, very important to change your breathing, especially if you have dysfunctional breathing pattern. And the only reason that I say this, I've seen many, many people coming through my doors over the years experiencing panic disorder and depression and anxiety, and they could not cope with just mindfulness. We had to change states 
and we had to change breathing. And you know it yourself. The last thing you want to do when you're in an emotional turmoil is pay attention to anything, to pay attention to what's going on in the mind or your breath. But we can do breathing exercises whereby you don't have to pay attention to your breathing. Even if you go for a walk with your mouth closed, if you go for a relatively fast walk with your mouth closed, because you're breathing through the nose, you're going to increase carbon dioxide in the blood and you're going to help to improve blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain, but you'll have a calming effect on the central nervous system. If you had a rebounder or if you were doing, bring breathing into your physical movement. If you don't, if you feel it very difficult to have your attention on the breath, don't have your attention on the breath. You can do small breath holds. You don't have to have your attention on your breathing. You're just counting. You can breathe in, breathe out, and hold your breath for five or 10 paces. You don't have to have your attention on your breathing. So you can still change states and you can stimulate the vagus nerve, but without having to actually direct your attention to your breath. Because I'd say that because it can be difficult for people who have anxiety that when they do start paying attention to their breathing, um, it can make them a little bit anxious. And the other thing is that the air hunger is, is not particularly nice. It can make you a little bit uncomfortable. But, you know, if we can have it at a, a level of air hunger that we're able to work with, starting off very gently and um, surrendering to the discomfort because we can train the body and mind then to deal better with that. Body aware, how many of us actually pay attention to our body that we're so stuck in our head? And you'll often see people, you know, they could be sitting down in a cafe, well, most of them or many people now are just looking into phones, but people that their legs are shaking. And oftentimes when I see a shaking leg, I have to ask, is this a mirror? Is this a reflection of what's going on in that person's mind? So that person with the shaking leg doesn't be aware of their leg is shaking, but nor are they aware of how agitated their mind is. Our physiology can give us away. And you will see that the individual with an agitated mind they're also having agitated movement. They can't sit still. They can't direct their attention. And it's really important that we bring our attention into the body. It's so, so wonderful to do. And go for a walk with every cell of your body. And you will be so surprised that the people that we are just teaching this, the most simple of stuff, and Daniel will testify to this, premiership footballers, and these guys are absolutely at the top of their game. And we use these simple techniques to change states because we want them going out onto a football field with every cell of their body, not just as a head. And if you're going to do a public presentation, you're going out with every cell of your body and you give your talk with every cell of your body. Because in order for us to, that the, the right action happens by the self, the critical mind has to get out of the way. And one way that the critical mind can get out of the way is that you have your attention dispersed throughout the body. The singer, a singer who is singing with every cell of their body, that they're not just singing stuck in thought. And again, you know, it's something that we can be doing. I would say start off with a small body part, um, your hands, for example. So let's practice it. And um, so what I would like you to do is just, you know, you're sitting there. I won't have the cameras on you, so you don't have to be too conscious. I'm actually going to minimize the screen so you can uh, jump around and make a fool of yourself and nobody's going to see you. But what I would like you to do is to have your, just place your hand out in front of you like so. And with your hand out in front of you like so, just gently close your eyes and bring your attention into your hand. And hold your attention in your hand. That's all. Just hold your attention in the hand. Do you feel the temperature of the room against the skin? Do you feel inner bodily sensations? You might, for example, you might feel temperature, pulse rate, inner bodily sensations. Hold your attention there. And now bring your attention as far as your elbow. Do you feel the clothes against your skin? Do you feel the temperature of your hand and the temperature of your, your forearm as far as your elbow? You might feel the air, the environment. You might feel inner bodily sensations. Hold your attention there. 
and your mind of course if it wanders off just bring your attention back it's it's normal that your mind is going to wander and it's not necessarily about thinking but you just might find that you are thinking about it but stick with it you know in time with a little bit of practice you have your attention in your hand and you're holding your attention there And now you can bring your attention from the tips of your fingers to your elbow, right up to your shoulder. And you're holding your attention there. You're feeling inner bodily sensations, close against your skin, the temperature of the body. Then you can bring your attention right across to your chest and hold your attention there. You can place your hand down. Do you feel the clothes against your skin, the temperature of your body, inner bodily sensations? So you're taking your attention out of your mind and into the area around your chest. And again, you might be thinking about it, but with practice, you will be able to take your attention out of the mind and into your chest without thought. And then bring your attention into your stomach, the area around your abdomen, and hold your attention there. You feel the movement of the tummy with every breath. You feel the temperature of your body. The clothes against your skin. Inner bodily sensations. Hold your attention there. Then you can bring your body in, you bring your attention into your right leg. Close against your skin, the inner bodily sensations, the temperature of your right leg. Hold your attention there. And into your left leg. Close against your skin, inner bodily sensations, temperature of your left leg. Hold your attention there. And as you sit and stand, are you able to bring your attention out of your head and literally disperse it throughout the body? That your attention is in your chest, the area around the stomach, your right arm, your left arm, your shoulders, your torso, your right leg, your left leg, and you're holding your attention there. So you, when you walk out on stage, walk out on stage with every cell of your body. Speak with every cell of your body. Play your game with every cell of your body. Drive your car with every cell of your body. So whenever you're ready, just to gently open your eyes. So this is getting into the body. So this is body awareness. So breath awareness, simply paying attention to your breathing. And I have no formal training in mindfulness. So my techniques or what I'm doing here is just something I, I do for myself. It's not going to be perfect, but it worked. And it's worked for me for 20 years. Um, we use the same techniques, bring them together with breathing. I think it's easier when you start off with a small body part, such as your hand, 
and there is a tendency for you to think about it. I think that's kind of normal. But then with practice, then you'll hold your attention there. And there's something about the feeling of energy when you walk with your attention dispersed throughout the body. And the other aspect of it is that it's almost that you're giving your, your mind a holiday. You've, you're taking a rest for, from the mind. And there's an intelligence going on in the human body that if you think of what's going on there without us having to pay any attention or to do anything about it, the autonomic nervous system, blood is flowing, oxygen is delivered, carbon dioxide is generated, you've got a metabolism, you've got a digestion system, you've all of those organs, you've got your heart it's pumping. There's an intelligence going on there and you don't have to do anything. So it's very nice to merge with that intelligence. And I know this might sound a little bit new agey. These tools are really, really so beneficial and simple. So starting off with the breath, I think the breath is the easiest. That was just for me. You might find it easier just to bring your attention onto your hand and hold your attention there. And this is really about awareness and taking our attention out of the mind and into the body. So whenever you go for a walk, bring your attention into the body and make a commitment to disperse your attention and to bring our attention into the body and to get out of our own head and to get out of our own way, you know, because how often if we were to effectively think about the thoughts that do go through the mind and somebody estimated, I think it was Eckhart Tolle that was talking about it years ago. He said, we have 70,000 thoughts every day and 95% of them are repetitive and useless. And you can imagine how draining that is of energy. So our option is to get, get into the body and we can live life by being in the body and especially in a beautiful place such as nature. And as, as I said, at the start, you might, you might notice that you're thinking about the body, but then you will merge with the, the inner bodily sensations. And it's, it's, it's lovely. It's nice to be there. So the third aspect of it is present moment awareness, because we as human beings communicate with life through our senses. And a, a young child understands this. They are taught that we have five senses in the main, and they include sight, smell, hearing, taste, touch. But how often do we truly communicate with life through our senses? that when you see with a soft gaze, that you're bringing all of your attention onto what you're seeing. You're smelling with all of your attention there. You're hearing with your attention there. And as I said, going into a restaurant and somebody puts a beautiful meal in front of you, you look at the meal with your attention. You're tasting it, you're smelling it, and you're fully experiencing the meal. But if you go into the restaurant, and somebody places a beautiful meal in front of you, but if you're stuck in your head, it's not the same experience. You might have a fleeting glimpse. For a split second, you see the meal. For a split second, you taste the meal. For a split second, you smell the meal, but you're not enjoying the meal because no sooner after the first bite, your attention is stuck in the head and all you've experienced is a bite. You haven't experienced the rest of the meal. It's the same going to a concert. It's the same even just sitting down listening to a piece of music. You might listen to the first couple of bars, but then bump, your attention is stuck in your head. So when you, this is just the human trait. This is the human trait that we have lost the capacity to, to fully experience life. And um, you'll probably be surprised that when you start paying attention and you're asking yourself, well, how often do I actually do bring my attention fully into the moment? And many people will talk about it, but it's really the experience. I think it's the experience of it. But be gentle on yourself because there's years of conditioning there and it, it does quieten. And you do have the capacity then to, to direct your attention. So you're looking around the room and you're really seeing, you're smelling and you're really smelling and you're connecting with life through our senses. And this is the innocence of a child as well. A young child, before they have been, before the mind has been developed into that analytical tool, 
is fully immersed in the moment. And it is, you know, it's about this. And that's why I suppose spirituality, people will often talk, they'll use the words being awake or being asleep. And are we awake if we are going through a life fully stuck in the head? You're going out onto a beautiful beach, experience the beach, the sights, the smells, the sounds, the, the touch. So the other aspect of it is that our capacity to bring our attention in, into the body and onto the breath and into the present moment is relative to how much our mind wanders. And if you're looking for the study, there's a Harvard study by Gilbert, and he looked at 5,000 individuals over 83 from 83 countries. He logged 250,000 data points, and he found that the human being, their minds wander all the time. But he asked a question, he says, are you doing something but thinking about something else? So for example, you could be doing a very mundane task. You're washing the dishes, although everybody is dishwashers, but I'll use that as an example. You're washing the dishes, but your attention is not on washing the dishes. You're thinking about something else. You're jumping to the future. You're stuck in the past, but you're not experiencing it. And they found that the human being, that our minds wander a lot, but the people whose minds wandered the most were least happy. And I think that says it all. And we know it ourselves, you know, somebody who is, and when we are in that situation, we're very stuck in our mind as well. And um, given that a lot of our thinking can be negative and critical. And by the way, this isn't about reducing your thought activity by 100%. I'll give you an example of this. In that course that I did back um, in 2000 or 99 or 2000, there were 60 of us doing it. And the instructor was all talking about stop thinking and no thoughts and stop thinking. And one of the participants there, he was then offered an investment opportunity. And of course, he was told by the instructor, don't think, don't think. And he went and he put $100,000 on this investment opportunity without due diligence, and he lost every penny. There is a time to think. It was Tony Quinn's course, by the way, Derval. There's a time to think and there's a time to stop thinking. There's a time to plan, but you can be in a beautiful place. And is that a time for thinking? Is it a time for planning? Is it a time for analyzing? Or is it a time for, for experiencing it? So just to bear in mind that, that it's not that you want to go through your entire life, stop thinking. Of course, it's very important to stop thinking. But it's also very important to be able to plan and analyze. So it's the balance. It's the balance. And there's a very good book, 10% Happier. I can't remember. I think it was Harris, is it? Dan Harris is his name. It's a book that's out a few years. Might be an interesting read for you. But on this topic, the best book that ever has come out, well, in my opinion, is The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Because when you read that book, it, it absolutely will bring you into present moment and Tom has read it and I'm sure many of you have read it that just even by reading the book it helps to bring a quietness to the mind and there's no doubt that the book was written in presence and this is the the, the strange thing about the human being you know how many scientists are actively talking about the ability that we are transmitting information beyond the words that we can influence each other based on our own states and when we are directing our attention. And I would also say that the capacity of a great therapist is their ability to have a quiet mind when they are working with their client. And if the therapist is consumed by thought, the thinking process is going to get in the way. And to allow intuition, and intuition is one of those senses. And even from a business point of view, I've seen business leaders the ones that have been most successful are intuitive because they can come up with fresh and original thinking. If we're just basing our decisions on logical thought, it's stale information. It's information that's already out there, but fresh and original and thinking is intuitive. But how do we tap into that intuition? It's very much having the quieter mind, but even directing our attention into a different area of the brain and holding our attention there 
and there is a doctor, Mark, I can't remember his surname, and his work is very much on this, bringing your attention into different parts of the brain to change states, because this is something that's new to me, but I think it's an, another tool that could be very wonderful. Um, it could be wonderful for people. So yeah, so out of our mind and to be more happy, because if we bear in mind that all of our thoughts, that many of them are probably critical and um, negative and put us into bad form, but judging by Dan Harris's book, if we had 10% less critical thoughts, we'd be 10% happier. Go for the 10%. It's a good place to start. And paying attention to the mind, being mind aware, we have two types of thoughts. We have our practical thoughts that are very important. So remember the guy who was going to do the investment, when he was offered the investment opportunity, he should sat down and carefully thought this through. This is a practical thought. The repetitive thought is that somebody did something to us 10 years ago, and I know they've done it once, but we have been doing it to ourselves ever since. That, you know, life experiences, we've all had some negative life experiences. I think it's the human being is that we do experience suffering. And I suppose it's part of that growing as well. It's paying attention to when we are in that train of thought, which is causing us stress, which is causing us tension, which is causing us agitation. But more, more often than not, we don't even know that we're in the train of thought because we're not paying attention to what we're thinking about. So it's really about often standing back and just paying attention to what's going on in my mind at the moment. Am I thinking the repetitive, the same old thoughts over and over again? Am I reinforcing that? And again, don't beat yourself up if you find that, yes, you are. At least now you're starting to become aware of it. And gently bring your attention onto your breathing or into your body, or into the present moment. Take your attention out of the thinking part of the mind and towards the back of the head. Hold your attention there. And the more you do it with a little bit of practice, the repetitive and the negative thinking can, can quieten. So we have to ask ourselves, is, it, is my thinking useful? You know, But how do we know that unless we are actually observing what we're thinking about and to be a gardener of the mind? So just as a gardener, a good gardener is going to be attentive to what's going on in their flower bed or garden. And if we are not, if a gardener is not paying attention, you've all got gardens, I'm sure. If you're not paying attention to your garden, it's going to get consumed by weeds. A good gardener is attentive to what's going on in the garden. We need to be attentive to what's going on in the mind. The weeds will appear, but if we can notice them quickly, and then gently bring our attention onto the breath or into the, into the moments. Now, people might say, well, why not think positively? I just feel that when thinking positive is, it's very difficult to do if there's an emotional turmoil there. Because if you're feeling pretty lousy and then you're saying to yourself, well, here I'm feeling pretty crap, but I shouldn't be feeling crap. I should be feeling good. Well, now you're saying that you don't want to accept where you're at and you want to be in a different position. But it's difficult to change that state. And then you'll start giving out to yourself that you should be feeling, you should have this lovely smile and you should be on top of the world. Um, not always easy. I think it's best if we can bring a quietness to the mind and it gets easier with a bit of practice. And of course you're going to be angry. And of course we're going to be sad. And of course we're going to be, these are all the human traits. You know, that's probably one of the flaws of Eckhart Tolle's books that he has experienced life and he's hit that spirituality that everything is serene all day long. And um, this has set the barrier and the barrier is pretty high, but he's unique and he is an experience that is beyond what, you know, I, well, this is only my own uh, opinion, but we will have good times. We will have not so good times, but the one thing is life is softer. That's all. And the highs don't be so high. And I don't know if you want the highs to be so high, but the lows don't be so low. It's nice to be somewhere in the middle. It's nice to be in that space. So I'm just looking at time now, talking about being in the now. 
and now we've got five minutes left. And the one thing about paying attention to what's going in the head is that the brain cannot tell the difference between something that is real and something that's imagined. And if we're thinking that if we're anxious about the future and we're continuously anxious and worried, well, your brain is not going to know if it's real or not. And that's a physiological stress. And I suppose the other thing about our thoughts is that we all interpret events and situations and opinions based on our, our own reality, our own conditioning. So I think this was a great that the illustrator um, Beck said, you have a bag of rice in front of it and the, the guy from Europe thinks it's rice pudding, ambrosia rice or something. And um, this shop here, I'm not India, is, is thinking it's a meal. And of course, the chap from Japan is, is, is thinking about Japanese food. And this is a, the same about situations that we all interpret them differently. But then we have to ask the question, who is right? And where is the truth in all this? Because we, of course, it's a natural thing that we, we believe our own thoughts to be so true. But maybe there's a second part to that story, or there's a third version of that story or a different interpretation. I think it's very important to focus on the process. My own journey getting into university, I had not good edu or not good concentration. I got in the first year and I reduced the four years to getting out of there. That's all I did. And I didn't enjoy the process because my mind was always racing towards the future. And if I was to do it again, to get into university, set your goal. Of course, set your goal, but have your attention in the present moment. That's what's more important. And let go of the outcome. And that's one thing about writing book. You could write a book and it could have zero sales or it could do okay. And you just have to let go of the outcome because if you had it in your head that you're going to set a goal that it's going to be this, that, or the other, well, you could very well be disappointed. So little tasks like that, let go of the outcome. When you're focusing on your breathing, let go of the outcome. When you're bringing your attention into the present moment, no matter what you're doing, focus. It's the process that's most important. And I'm kind of just going to leave it at that because I just want to, and I've covered the main teams there and I want to keep it to the hour. And um, this is a recording that will be up on YouTube. There is another part one of this as well that's also up on YouTube and I'm going to stop